Aaron Rupar. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. So my first question, why do you think that you got banned by Elon Musk from Twitter? Well, I know why I got banned. It took me a few hours to figure it out because Twitter was not very communicative at first, but uh, the offending tweet was one where I linked to the Facebook page of an account that tracks his private jet using publicly available information. And Twitter has deemed this, I guess more accurately, Elon Musk has deemed this to be a security threat uh, against his family, as he puts it. And so uh, myself and a number of other journalists were suspended for posting that link. Uh, coincidentally, all of us happen to also have been critical of Elon, which I suspect may have had something to do with this beyond tweeting the link to this Facebook page. But um, I was suspended on Thursday evening. Later that night, I finally heard from Twitter confirming that indeed it was linking to that Facebook page that led to my suspension. Were you surprised at all that this happened when you did see that you were actually suspended from Twitter? I was very surprised. And in fact, on Thursday, I had a very light tweeting day because we're up here in Minnesota and we had a huge blizzard that day. So both of my kids were home from daycare. And so it was kind of a struggle that afternoon just to watch our kids. And I basically logged off for the afternoon. And so when I started getting messages that evening that I had been suspended from Twitter and pulled up my account to kind of confirm, you know, if that was the case and saw that it was indeed the case, um, I was shocked. And it took me a bit to even process what may have happened because um, I had no idea what tweet would have triggered that. Um, and like I said, the, the tweet in question, actually, I posted the day prior on Wednesday morning. So by then I'd already kind of forgotten, you know, that I had even posted anything about this Elon Jet stuff. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I tend to think of, and I think most of us think of Twitter suspensions as being like a pretty severe punishment, you know, if you're harassing someone or, you know, in Trump's case, if you incite an insurrection using Twitter or something like that. So to get banned for what I thought was a pretty thin reason was definitely a shock to me. So a question kind of pops up. If this is happening, is it infringing on free speech by, you know, you tweeting out a link or talking about something and you're suspended? Well, it's not infringing on free speech. And it's actually quite interesting. Um, I have been overwhelmed with how much interest in the story there's been both here in the US and abroad. And yesterday, I, I did a number of interviews with international media outlets who wanted to talk about this. And some of them wanted to frame this story around free speech and, you know, kind of ask questions about like, isn't this an infringement on your free speech? And I had to explain that in the US, free speech is basically the government not interfering with speech. So if the Biden administration told Twitter, hey, uh, we don't want any content that's critical of the president. You need to delete these posts. That would be an infringement on Twitter's free speech. But a private company deciding what to platform, what to publish or, you know, not publish, but what to host on their platform and what not to is their prerogative. So this is Elon's prerogative to do this. But I think the thing that is more glaring here is the hypocrisy that's at play, because Elon just weeks ago said that his commitment to free speech, as he understands it, extended all the way to this Elon Jet account. And he made kind of a, you know, he publicly declared that he was fine with this account being on Twitter, and then he walked that back. And so that was what prompted my tweet in the first place that got me suspended, was not that I'm interested in any way really in the Elon Jet stuff, was just that Facebook, you know, determined that this page was appropriate and using public information, so there was no problem. Whereas Twitter, which Elon is trying to, you know, purportedly turn into this bastion of free speech and robust debate, determine that for whatever reason that was not acceptable on their platform. So I want to be clear that, you know, I, I don't view myself as being a victim of any sort of infringement of my speech rights. It's just that, you know, I think that this platform uh, could be run in a more effective way than it's being run right now. What do you think the future of Twitter holds at this point? There's a lot up in the air. People are talking about this nonstop. It's in countless news reports ever since Elon Musk took over. What is the future of Twitter overall? Well, I think this is a big inflection point for people like myself, media outlets, journalists to kind of assess how much we can rely on Twitter going forward to be a tool that we use for news gathering, to develop audiences. Um, because, you know, in my case, to just briefly touch upon the timeline here, I posted this tweet on Wednesday morning and then Wednesday evening, Elon posted some tweets saying that from now on linking to pages that track his movements are violations of the terms of service. And so what happened was I ended up being suspended for a tweet that when I posted it did not violate any of Twitter's terms of service, but only retroactively was determined to have done that. 
And so if he has that power to basically retroactively determine that something you post um, is unacceptable, it can get you suspended, then obviously he can do that, you know, in basically any instance and ban people for no reason whatsoever, or, you know, a reason that they can concoct after the fact. So, you know, I think we've all kind of, you know, in the media industry relied on Twitter over the past decade for a variety of reasons, you know, whether that be talking to sources, um, spreading stuff that we've published to audiences, developing audiences. And I think this is kind of an object lesson that, you know, we can't really bank on Twitter being stable over time at this point. And for me personally, it prompted me to get active on post news this week. I'm going to try and get busy on Mastodon to kind of build some audiences on other platforms that I can have a little more assurance um, will allow me to keep posting there. But one thing I will also mention is that in my case, being an independent journalist who runs a newsletter business, um, I'm very reliant on Twitter, and it took me a very long time to build the following that I have. I mean, I've been working hard for a decade to get up near a million followers, and I rely upon that as a lifeblood of my business and a way to get new eyeballs on my content. So, you know, it's also kind of a bummer that, you know, all this hard work now is kind of in danger. And so I was grateful that my account was restored. But going forward, I'm certainly going to be mindful of the fact that we can't really depend on Twitter like we have over the past decade. So you had that temporary suspension. You're obviously back on there now. Do you think at some point you end up getting permanently banned from Twitter? <laughs> I hope not. Um, that would be unfortunate. But yeah, I mean, all bets are kind of off. Um, I was talking with some colleagues this morning, you know, fellow journalists about the suspension of a woman named Lynette Lopez, who's a reporter for Insider. And she has done a number of investigations about Tesla. Um, she's done very fair news coverage, but critical coverage of Elon Musk. And she was banned yesterday, and I don't even think Twitter has tried to explain why that happened. It just seems like she was banned basically because she's been a critic of Elon Musk and done critical reporting on his businesses. So, you know, I, I really can't predict what might cause someone like me to get banned, but I think that was probably part of the intention here is that by suspending people like me and other people who have been critical of him, Elon is kind of implementing a chilling effect upon criticism of him because you just can't be sure, even if it's, you know, kind of something that you criticize in passing, if that'll be the thing that kind of sets him off where you get banned. And so, you know, in my case, I'm probably going to have to think twice next time I want to do a newsletter article or even just a tweet that's criticizing him because I don't want to get banned. I hope I don't get banned. Um, but this is his playground. And again, you know, if he wants to kick people out of it, uh, we may not like it, but that's his prerogative to do that. Of course. Do you think that other uh, platforms like Mastodon that you were talking about, do they have a future to where they could actually compete with Twitter? I certainly don't think Mastodon does because my sense, and I'm not speaking from a place here of deep expertise because I've only sort of dabbled on Mastodon. I'm not, um, I do have an account on there, but I haven't really developed any sort of following or posted a lot on there. But if you're kind of a tech novice, it's pretty complex. You have to understand how servers work. And it's not very intuitive to create an account. You have to determine what server you want to be on. And it's, you know, each server has different rules of the road in terms of moderation and things like that. So I think for people who are kind of lay people who just want to get on social media to maybe follow the news, uh, stay in touch with people that they know, things like that, I don't really see Mastodon having the potential to reach the sort of scale uh, that would approximate what Twitter has right now. I do think post news uh, has some potential. It actually, in some ways, reminds me a little bit more in layout uh, of Facebook because they don't have the at replies like they do on Twitter, you know, where you, you don't, the replies are more of like a comment section than a stream of replies, but it's very intuitive. The interface is quite slick and it incentivizes more kind of text based, longer form posting rather than Twitter, where you have a lot of GIFs and memes, videos, things like that. So that's not necessarily for everyone, but um, I've been impressed with what I've seen from posts so far, but I think the big barrier is that these alternatives just do not have the scale that Twitter does. And that's part of the beauty of Twitter is that brands, public figures, sports teams, um, journalists, everybody is kind of on Twitter. And so when there is something like a World Cup happening or a major news event, you can talk with newsmakers, interact with people, and it really feels like a public conversation in a way that post, which just, just does not have the user base at this point, does not feel that way. So, um, you know, I think these things obviously evolve over time. Uh, when I was in college, MySpace was dominant, you know, then Facebook came and kind of crushed MySpace and then Facebook kind of declined and now Twitter is predominant for news at least. And so, you know, these things will evolve and I have faith that something will emerge, but I don't 
I don't know for sure that any of the ones on offer right now will be the thing that kind of supplants Twitter over the long haul. I gotcha. Aaron Rupar, thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else that you want to add before we let you go? Yeah, I would just say I publish a newsletter called Public Notice. I cover U.S. media and politics. I'll have a post on Monday kind of unpacking this whole Twitter suspension thing and some additional thoughts on it. So if you want to check out my newsletter, check it out at aaronrupar.substack.com.